So wow, if we were to take the Bible just at face value here, this could be the shortest sermon that Pastor Jen has ever preached. It sounds something like this, unity is grand. Go out, sell all of your stuff and love one another, including making sure that no one is in need. The end, mic drop, bam, we're done. Although it does sound darn near impossible, there is something to be said for the simplicity in that message. But we know all of these years later that the Bible tends not to be quite so simple. So first things first, we know that the Bible was written in a particular time and in a particular context. So in order to understand the scriptures, we first need to take a little bit of time to get to know about what was going on when they were written. So we open up the psalm, and it says all of this stuff about precious oil flowing down beards and dew on the top of some obscure mountain. What on earth does all of that mean in the first place? Well, you see, oil and dew were actually uh, very great symbols of refreshment in the hot Pal Palestinian climate. And this psalm was probably one that people used on pilgrimage. So as they were traveling from one place to a sacred place together, and oftentimes when they did that, they had to walk miles and miles and miles in the heat, through the deserts, up and down hills and mountains. So imagine with me, if you will, that you are journeying. You are on one of these journeys, miles and miles and miles long, and it is hot, and you can find no refreshment. And then you wake up one morning, and suddenly there is this cool dew out the, the uh, door of your tent cooling things down, refreshing them, renewing things. You might get a second wind and imagine that you could actually carry on a little bit. And that is what the psalmist is saying that dwelling together in unity feels like. Because of the pilgrimage aspect of this psalm, people presumed that referring to uh, being able to live and travel together in unity was both being able to travel and live together in unity with actual blood relatives, but also with all of these other folks who were sharing this faith at that time. So now if you have siblings or children, then you may have a sense of how difficult it is to dwell together in unity. My brother and I are close now. We actually are uh, one of each other's confidants and advisors at times. But when we were younger and growing up, our parents used to check to make sure we were still alive if they didn't hear us disagreeing and bothering one another for a little bit in an afternoon together. And we don't go too long in my household now without little voices saying things like, mommy, she's copying me, or mommy, he's looking at me. Really, really? <laughs> I said, these are all things that my parents used to say, my brother and I said to each other, and you know what they say about payback, friends. <laughs> So I remember the day very vividly then that it all clicked for me and my brother. And we decided that it took much less energy to like one another than it did to fight. I was 12 and he was 16 and considering service in the military after high school graduation. And so we knew that one day we wouldn't be around each other under the same roof anymore. <laughs> So it would be great, perhaps, to spend the time that we had left actually getting along. That and the fact that I was already OK at doing some high school homework didn't hurt too much. <laughs> there was this dramatic shift in our relationship that day. It was refreshing not only to us, but certainly to our parents, who appreciated the fact that there was much less, much less yelling and screaming in our house. It meant that we could be in the same room in the same car, <laughs> on the same journey, one with another, without driving everyone around us up the proverbial wall. It meant that there was hope for us and for our relationship. One translation of this passage in the Psalms starts out, how wonderful, how beautiful, when brothers and sisters get along. There is a sense of calm and peace when it can happen a sense of renewal and refreshment, a sense that in that relationship, there is something of a real and true gift. And so 
We take our turn with the Acts of the Apostles, and we look at the relationship between and among those early followers of Jesus' way. Acts is interesting in that it is not only a seeming play-by-play of the places where the Holy Spirit showed up and started working amongst and between and in the people, or where what Jesus taught finally clicked with the disciples. It's like they woke up one day and were like, oh, so that's what he meant, and started building these communities. But it's also believed to have been written by a historian. So someone who took great pains and awesome and placed awesome value in describing what was actually happening in the life of communities back then. Descriptions about places and about the people and about how the people lived and ordered themselves in community together. So when this section of Acts describes people living in community, owning no possessions of their own, selling everything that they had and giving it to be used by everyone according to their need. It means that that was actually the way that some believers lived at the time. Now I say some because that was the way that the early Christians in Jerusalem lived, but perhaps no other early communities of Christian faith believed or lived in that way. But in this particular group, it says that people really did sell off their land and their homes, brought the proceeds to the apostles, and they distributed it to people. And it wasn't just like they went, here, here's $20 for you, and here's $20 for you, and here's $20 for you, and here's $20 for you. They got what they needed in order to live. Now, looking at the scripture now, sitting in Brookfield, Connecticut in 2015, we look at it and we go, why on earth would they do something crazy like that? But the answer is right there in the four verses that Gordon read for us this morning. Something had happened to the disciples in those days since Jesus' death and resurrection. They had this newfound sense of hope and a sense that there was more to be done, more to be said, more to be lived. They had a sense that there was something new and big happening, a chance at this new kind of life, lived in freedom from the bondage of the systems that had oppressed them. They knew that it wasn't going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination, but they preached charismatically and they taught and people caught on. They looked at these new believers and they said, I want some of what you got. I think that's one of the things that we hope people might actually say about us nowadays. People got behind their vision and their mission. People began to create these sacred communities, communities in which they learned and grew and shared their time and talent and treasures, communities in which they grew to know one another and to care about one another, to really care about one another. They weren't mindless drones. They all had their sense of who they were and what they had to offer to the life of the church, but they also held on to the vision and mission of bringing about peace and justice and freedom. They got on the train together. In that way, they managed to set an example of what an ideal sacred community could be, of what an ideal church could be, perhaps. Now, looking at our life and times now, it seems difficult, if not impossible, to envision all of us selling off all of our possessions, pooling our money together, and making sure that not only us, but all of the people in this community who are in need have everything that they need in order to be cared for the best way possible. We do live in a different time and a different place, but I believe that some of the tenets of the early church certainly still hold true to us today. We are called to be generous with our time and talent and treasures. And that becomes abundantly clear as we talk about our budget today and as we head toward our annual meeting and the installation of new committee members and discuss the needs of our church community and the community beyond these walls as well. We are called to care for each other and for the community outside, to look at the needs of others, physical, spiritual, emotional, and to see if there is some way that we can help fulfill those needs, either as individual people of faith or as a community. Whether it is through a special project or holding people in prayer or opening up to hear someone's different opinion and figure out where we might be able to meet in the middle. We are called to love one another as we have first been loved. 
We are called to get on the same mission and vision boat with one another, friends. The ultimate mission of the church, I believe, is to change the world. No small task right there. But I believe that we are to leave this world a place that is ultimately more equitable, more just, more peaceful, more loving. To bring about at least a little bit of God's kingdom to this part of the earth. All the things that we choose to do, all the pursuits that we choose to take on, all the time that we spend in fellowship, learning, and service should lead to the attainment of these particular goals. As we head through this Easter season, we will be asking ourselves the question about why faith matters and examining that answer from a whole bunch of different angles. Now, if someone asked me why my faith matters, I would have a whole bunch of different answers, I'm sure, and some of them would all be dependent upon the day and the time at which you asked me. But one of the reasons why my faith has mattered most to me in my life is because of this sense of sacred community. The sense of a community that shares with one another, cares for and loves one another in the world, that strives to learn and grow together and serve together. You see, it has been in sacred community for me in the church that I have been nurtured and cared for, where I can be me and not have others judge who I am or who it is that I am becoming, where I have been offered opportunities to serve both in my immediate community and in communities as far away as the Dominican Republic, where I have offered my gifts and skills and had them accepted and put to use, where I have been prayed for and have been able to get to know others through their prayers as well. This sacred community provides those opportunities. This one, right here, in this place, if we are but willing to take them. Perhaps the most apparent hallmark of that first Christian community was that they trusted each other. They had to in order to turn all of their belongings over. They trusted each other to do what was right and good. They trusted each other to do God's will. They trusted each other with their lives. And they trusted God, too. They trusted that God, who had offered them so many gifts, would continue to make a way for them and continue to provide direction and guidance. But in order to trust one another and God, they had to know one another and God. So in the context of the here and now in this sacred community, I ask you, how well do you know God? Or perhaps, how might you get to know God better? And as I use that word you, I realize that what I am really saying is, how well do we know God? (laughs) And how well do we wish to know God better? Because I certainly don't have all of the answers there are to have. But perhaps the answer is one of our small group opportunities, or perhaps the answer is a new spiritual discipline. I was just thinking today how beautiful it is outside, and we can see our labyrinth again. Let's get out in the backyard, friends, and do some walking. The other question is, how well do you know the person who is sitting next to you this morning, or sitting near you, if you're a loner (laughs) today? If the answer is not too well, then I invite you to ask them some questions. The greeter bios in our bulletins have helped so many people to make connections to one another, as have our committee and small group opportunities. But sometimes it's just a matter of paying attention to the prayers that are lifted up in worship on Sunday morning and asking a follow-up question or two to the person who asks for them or asking what someone does for a living or what they like to do when they're not doing that thing for a living. It is much more difficult to overlook the needs or the opinions or the passions of another person once you get to know them. And that goes for people both inside and outside of the church. Getting to know people then is how we build community. The people in that early community needed to be bold in sharing about themselves. After all, they were now living in true community, one with another, completely exposed to and reliant on each other. They needed to be bold in sharing about their faith because it was the new life they found through that faith that led them to gather and serve behind that common mission. And they needed to be bold about loving because it was through that love that they cared for each other and the world. 
So in this sacred community, I invite us to follow their example. May we be bold in sharing about ourselves and getting to know each other. May we be bold in sharing about why our faith matters in the first place and why it is that we're sitting here on a beautiful Sunday morning in the first place. May we be bold in loving one another and the world. Because, my friends, this sacred community has a lot of life left to live, and we are the ones writing the story now. May it be a life that works toward attaining the goals of love and justice and, and peace, and writing a story that inspires others in years to come. Amen. <laughs>